Hi all, Dr. May here. Um, this is the first of a four-part series on blood and cardiac infections. The first thing we're going to focus on are infections of the heart itself as opposed to the circulatory system. For each of these videos, I'm going to have an outline slide, outline slide and point out where precisely we are in the process and all that good stuff. So here goes. So for your outline, the first video is going to be cardiac infections of all flavors, if you like. Uh, we're going to talk about myo and pericarditis, acute versus subacute endocarditis, and then a post-infectious cardiac disease. This is for this video. You are here. Okay, video two is going to be hematological parasitology, three are viremias and hemorrhagic fevers, and then four is bacteremia and sepsis. All right, the very first thing I want to start talking to you about is bacterial, aka infective endocarditis. I am going to talk a lot more about the two different types on the next couple of slides, but to give you kind of a brief overview of endocarditis as opposed to the two other uh, bacterial cardiac infections I'm going to mention in a second, I just wanted to give an idea of what exactly we mean when we say that. So endocarditis is when you have an infection on the interior side of the heart, and so this diagram as it is labeling right here is where you have an infected surface on, in this case, a tricuspid valve. You can see it in the mitral valve, you can see it other surfaces of, of the interior of the heart. When we say endocarditis, what we mean is the infection is on this surface, uh, sorry, surface or inward. Anything that is an infection within the muscle itself, within the muscle wall, I should say, down here, that's myocarditis. Anything in the pericardium, so the sac around the heart, be it the walls or the interior fluid or anything else, that's pericarditis. Okay, so infective endocarditis has several different risk factors. We'll go into um, those in a little bit more detail. But when you're looking at an endocarditis patient, their risk factors that you're going to be dealing with are some kind of recent invasive procedure, or dental work, anything that's going to allow for introduce, introduction of, of uh, bacteremia. So anything that's going to put bacterial cells directly into the bloodstream. Um, that includes getting a tattoo recently, IV drug use, in addition to medical procedures. The other thing that, that puts one at particular risk for especially subacute endocarditis is to have an underlying heart valve defect. The good news here is that these patients, you're usually already going to know about them. So when they come in with symptoms of endocarditis, go into what those are on the next slide, you're going to start thinking about this right away. So that's the good news. Before we go into that in greater detail, though, there are two other cardiac infections that are related to bacteria, one infectious, one post-infectious that I want to just mention briefly. The first is the post-infectious process, and that's rheumatic fever. What you can see in these uh, growth pathology images, which are uh, show classic rheumatic fever lesions on the mitral valve, and these classic lesions look like this. It's this region right here that you want to be looking at where you have these nice, really strong erythematous lesions um, along the surface, which clearly are, are not typical. There's a lot of inflammation going on there. Rheumatic fever is post-infectious because it, at its core, is an autoimmune process. This is not a condition that you see in a classic autoimmune patient. So having an, a previously existing autoimmune disease has nothing to do with whether or not you develop rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever happens subsequent to a streptococcus pyogenes infection. So a patient can come in with strep throat and then two, three, four weeks later come in with cardiac symptoms and, and 
and be diagnosed with rheumatic fever. The issue here is that a particular protein made by strep pyogenes called the M protein. Sorry, there's M, M for M protein. They seem to cross react with a protein that's on the surface of myocardial cells. And the issue with that is that all of the immunity that happens during strep pyogenes more or less overcomes self-tolerance so that you start having a, an immunological response against this um, M protein and it's close enough where it'll start binding on to uh, cardiac myocytes. The issue here, much with um, much is the same as several autoimmune processes, is that antibodies grab on, they can't be opsonized because they're part of a larger tissue, and so phagocytic cells start degranulating directly onto the tissue. So you could imagine that's going to cause quite a lot of necrosis and damage and inflammation. Um, the reason we don't see this all the time is that, fortunately, uh, it's only a small subset of the population that has this particular antigen that's cross-reactive with the strep M protein. So that being said, you do see it from time to time kind of running in families. The important point that may, might have you start thinking about uh, rheumatic fever when a patient presents is not only that they've had a recent strep infection, but this is a very age range specific malady. You see it in kids that are usually between the ages of 5 and 15. You don't see it in 30 year old adults. You don't see it in infants. So the age range is a big tip off here. Uh, the other thing that you would see, the other things I should say that you'd see clinically, in addition to uh, what you'd expect with, with this level of cardiac damage, so you'd have chest pain and shortness of breath and whatnot, is that you have a patient with a new murmur who did not have a murmur before, and they'll also be presenting to you as still being quite sick. They'll have a concurrent fever usually, they may have joint pain and just diffuse myalgias. This person who comes in is quite clinically ill and if they've had a recent strep infection are in the right age range and have a new murmur this might be something that you want to consider. The other um, active cardiac infection that we want to look at and then this is this is active this is not post-infectious like fever is is Lyme carditis. So patients that um, have Lyme disease. 99% of the time are, are going to have a, a classic presentation and provided they get treatment in a timely fashion they'll recover and things will be okay. 1% of Lyme patients wind up developing a complication called Lyme carditis, meaning they have uh, Lyme spirochetes spreading to their bloodstream during active infection. And when that happens, you have patients developing what's called cardiac block. So just in this, as this kind of simple diagram shows, you have electrical currents that are going throughout the heart, and some of them stem from the atrioventricular node. During heart block that's associated with Lyme carditis, what you see is that this current pathway here is blocked off, and then you aren't having electrical transduction happening. In reality, this is a simple diagram that shows this in kind of an on-off capacity with Lyme carditis and, and I'm going to assume many, many other things. It's not quite that simple where you have this nice, clean light switch type of appearance. You have partial block, you have... Um, and, and so doing that, what happens is that you have some current flowing and some being disrupted. And so you don't have a person suddenly drop dead of Lyme carditis the moment they have it. A patient with Lyme carditis is going to present with chest pain, but in addition to that, they're going to have, for obvious reasons, palpitations and arrhythmia. So that's something that's quite distinct from this or this. In each case, you tend to have chest pain and shortness of breath, 
in each case you tend to have new and induced murmurs, but here's the only place where you're going to really be having these types of, of clinical signs. The obvious red flag for infection here is a patient who currently has or recently had Lyme disease. Patients that come in with Lyme carditis, again, are usually in the process of, of dealing with Lyme disease, and so they're not recovered yet, frankly. So they may also come in with fever, joint pain, diffuse myalgia, things like that. Okay, so those are our three big cardiac infections. Now we're going to talk in more detail about infective endocarditis. So bacterial endocarditis aka infective endocarditis, it comes in, in two different flavors. You have acute and subacute, or chronic. Nearly always, you're dealing with two different organisms that are going to be causing these two conditions. For acute endocarditis, you're usually nine times out of ten looking at Staph aureus. Occasionally, you also see strep pyogenes. I gave this a little star over here uh, to, to indicate that strep pyogenes causes acute endocarditis. It can also cause acute myocarditis, and oftentimes it'll cause them in the same patient. But again, nine times out of ten, we're, we're looking at Staph aureus. Subacute endocarditis is quite different. Uh, here, you're more often than not looking at an enterococcus species. I just left it at the species level as um, this, this organism's taxonomy is a bit of a mess and it doesn't really matter which species, they all behave quite the same clinically. In addition, you can see alpha hemolytic streps or group D streps. Um, this would be strep mutans, mitis, sanguis, all those guys. Um, sometimes you'll see these referred to by clinicians as the viridans group. Uh, I would be remiss as a taxonomist if I didn't point out that that is not a thing. Um, you hear it said, and, and this is who it's referring to, but it's not really a thing. And if you ever hear somebody say refer to an organism called Streptococcus viridans, do me a favor and smack them in the face for me, because that is really not a thing. Anyways, um, but that's that's beside the point. Before we talk about the presentations of acute versus subacute, I just want to again mention these risk factors that we, we said on the previous slide. The risk factors for infective endocarditis are as follows. If you have a if you have a patient who's got a history of IV drug use or a recent internal infection or childbirth, these patients have a way of getting bacteria into their bloodstream that is going to more often than not be more consistent with this pathology over here. Uh, in recent internal infections, we're talking about someone who has, say, septic arthritis or a purple fever or something where if you have an aggressive organism like these two, um, you can have invasion of the vasculature and then hematogenous spread of those bacteria all throughout the body and if they so happen to colonize in the heart you're going to have an acute endocarditis presentation. On the other hand, risk factors uh, such as having an inserted prosthetic or having an abnormal heart valve structure, these are more consistent with subacute endocarditis. So you wouldn't expect to necessarily see subacute endocarditis in an IV drug patient, in an IV drug user. Stranger things have happened, but it's it's um, it's less likely than they would have acute complications from uh, infective endocarditis. In many instances, other than you know direct death, are emboli. I will come back to this in about four seconds, if you will. So acute endocarditis, just to talk about how these patients look when you see them in the ER, because that's typically where you see these guys, they will have completely unremarkable health history and then have a sudden onset fever. And they will have a murmur developing when they did not have one before. That is key. It's a huge difference between these two because, again, one of the risk factors for subacute endocarditis is having a, a structural defect in, the, in one of the heart valves. 
So having a sudden onset murmur is a real big tip off that, that you're dealing with an acute endocarditis. In addition, there are um, three clinical signs that, that people see as being associated. One is to develop a petechial rash. This is a rash we haven't actually met in class yet. It's one of the last ones we haven't met in class yet. But petechia, they look very much like this. They're kind of bright red and angry and inflamed looking. These are actually pinpoint areas of capillary leakage. So you have hemorrhaging into the dermal tissue. And that's why these look like red spots. They're not areas of kind of contained controlled inflammation the way macules or papules are. Uh, these are these are um, pinpoint areas of hemorrhage. So one of the ways you can tell petechia apart from other many other types of rashes is that petechia don't blanch. So what we mean by blanching is if you have a rash and you press down on it and then take your thumb away, uh, you'll see for just a second that the rash area is white and then the color and redness kind of flows back in. Petechia do not do that. If you press onto them, they stay just as red as if you didn't. Speaking of, uh, of uh, macular, rashes, macular rashes, another thing that you tend to see in infective endocarditis patients, sorry, acute infective endocarditis patients, are Janeway lesions. These are macular rashes that you see on the palms. They look exactly like any other macular rash, except apparently some dude named Janeway discovered that they're associated with endocarditis, so you have to call them that when you're dealing with uh, infective endocarditis. So, that's my little snarky comment for the moment. Um, the last thing you may see, if you think to look for it, are something called Roth spots, and these are pinpoint areas of hemorrhages on the retina, so here's one right here. Pathophysiologically, these are exactly like petechia, except that instead of being in the dermal tissue, you have hemorrhage into the retina. Okay, so the way that you diagnose acute endocarditis is by performing an echocardiogram and blood cultures. When you perform an echocardiogram, being able to see vegetations on it is going to give you your positive indicator, and then the uh, positive blood cultures are confirmatory. What I mean by vegetations are these deals right here. So this is, I'm going to actually erase that so you guys can see it better. Um, okay, so this um, echocardiogram right here shows the mitral valve in particular. Um, instead of being nice and thin and lacy looking, it's actually covered with yuck. All of this stuff and all of this crud that's covering the valve uh, as it moves back and forth and opens and closes is actually, um, these are these literally called vegetations, but what they are are areas of just dead necrotic tissue, fibrin, deposit, fibrin deposition, um, coagulated yuck, for lack of a better term, uh, and, and dead and encased and biofilmed bacterial cells. In acute endocarditis, you don't usually have time for biofilm formation to play a major role in the vegetations, but in subacute, you actually do. The funny thing is that on an echocardiogram, the cardiac vegetations that you form here and here look very much the same. It's just a time course in which they form. That's that's quite different. Um, so when you see this on an echocardiogram, you be, you can do an empirical diagnosis of infective endocarditis, and you start treating that patient immediately before you get the blood cultures back. Acute endocarditis is a rapidly deteriorating situation. Uh, so this is a gross path lesion, um, and this is actually from a uh, from a subacute endocarditis patient. But the pathology is quite the same. These here these kind of yellowy, greeny areas, these are the actual vegetations. And when these get large enough and the inflammation gets severe enough during acute endocarditis, they can actually rupture the chordae tendineae here. And when that happens, you have a patient who needs an immediate valve replacement. And if they do not get that in time, this will be a fatal outcome. And when I say in time, we're talking a matter of 
24, 36, 48 hours. This is a very rapidly progressing situation. On the other hand, um, subacute endocarditis, oh sorry, I should mention uh, for acute endocarditis, since we start empiric treatment before we get blood cultures back, since again 99% of the time we're, or sorry, 90% of the time we're dealing with this organism, you start treating the patient with IV vancomycin because you have to cover uh, MRSA as well as MSSA, so you don't start with a anything that's that's going to be um, escaped by MRSA. So we start with vancomycin. Okay, um, so to look at subacute itis, again we're looking at different organisms, the way that these patients present is extremely different than acute endocarditis patients. In this case, we are looking at patients that are going to come in with fatigue, with a low-grade fever. They're usually anemic if you do blood work. So they have a classic kind of influenza-like illness. They just don't feel good. And again, the, the helpful thing here is that a lot of times you're already familiar with these patients because they've either recently had a surgical procedure or... Um, or they've got an they've got an indwelling device like a pacemaker or a stent or something like that, uh, and then if they don't have an indwelling device or a prosthetic valve, they you may be following them as a as a um, murmur patient or somebody who's got an abnormally structured valve anyway. So when these types of patients come in with this set of clinical signs, you want to start thinking right away about subacute endocarditis. Um, that's not to say that it's only these patients. You may have a patient who has an undiagnosed uh, valvular abnormality, and so it's still something to check for. The way you check for it is um, exactly the same as the way you check for acute endocarditis. You perform an echocardiogram and blood cultures. If you see vegetations and you get positive blood cultures, then you can diagnose that patient with uh, subacute endocarditis. Um, in addition to that, I forgot to mention, uh, if you have a murmur patient and you're following them, if their murmur has changed, if it's gotten a little worse or if it sounds a little different, that might also be a, a tip-off that you're dealing with a subacute endocarditis. Okay, so those are our bacterial infections of the heart. I'm next going to talk a little bit about viral infections of the heart. Oh, actually, I apologize. I must circle this for emphasis that the way you're going to tell apart an acute versus a subacute is not only your patient population, so IV drug, recent uh, internal infection or surgery, that's this guy up here, um, somebody with prosthetics in their heart or their bloodstream, and abnormal valves, that's these guys down here. In both cases, since vegetations are part of the equation and this vegetation here um, you could imagine since the way that it's formed is by this accumulation of yuck of just you know, fibrin clots and dead tissue and the sticky bacterial biofilms in the case of subacute this is not a stable structure and since it's moving it's highly prone to have pieces of it break off and so Pieces of things that break off and fly off into the bloodstream are also known as emboli. And as you, as you, um, I'm sure have found out, or will sort, will shortly if you have not, these are um, associated with a whole bunch of bad outcomes. So you need to take endocarditis patients quite seriously, even if they are subacute and they're up walking around and they're not really um, doing much except feeling crappy, you really have to be very careful because you don't want them to develop a, a vegetative embolus. All right, that said, now that is all of our points about uh, bacterial cardiac infections. I want to talk really briefly about viral cardiac infections. So viral cardiac infections can be associated with myocarditis, pericarditis, or endocarditis, or one or more of those at the same time. So again, just remembering endocarditis would be internal of the heart and in the valves. Myo is actually in the heart muscle itself, and peri is in that sac that sits around it. So the most common causes of viral cardiac infections by a landslide are Coxsackie A, Coxsackie B, and various um, 
sorry, that's supposed to say enteroviruses, and it's spelled wrong, uh, various uh, typed and untyped enteroviruses. Usually you see viral cardiac infections in patients that have underlying valve defects. One of the most common ones that this is associated with is uh, having a prolapsed mitral valve. Again, you can't always rule this out because some patients may have structural defects that you have not yet diagnosed. But that being said, if you have a patient um, come in with chest pain and shortness of breath, uh, viral cardiac infections don't usually have fever associated with them, but if you've got a patient with underlying valve defects, they come in with shortness of breath and, and chest pain, you're obviously going to check them out very carefully, uh, as you would anybody who comes in with those symptoms. But a real um, helpful uh, uh, diagnostic tip-off that you might be dealing with a viral uh, cardiac infection is that if this patient has recently had cold symptoms or their household contacts have had cold symptoms, um, this is, is a really probable diagnosis. As we discussed earlier in the semester, Coxsackie A, B, and many enteroviruses, it's exactly what they cause, just junky common cold type stuff, and then Coxsackie's will also cause that very severe uh, uh, painful pharyngitis with, that has the uh, herpangina lesions. So if your patient or anyone in their house has had those and they come in with that presentation, that's a pretty clear indication you're dealing with a, with a viral infection. I also want to point out that there are some, um, if you think back to our JD and Dr. Cox video from, from the show Scrubs, there are some zebras here. Uh, again, most of the time you're going to be dealing with one of these three guys, but there are some others. These three have come up uh, as a fairly common alternative to the top three uh, viruses, and then there are about a, 10 or 20 more that have one or two case reports, uh, so I don't think we need to get into them for simplicity's sake. But the ones that, that come up as common alternatives are hepatitis C, parvovirus B19, and adenoviruses, random collection of adenoviruses. So if you are thinking your patient has a hep C viral carditis, this is important to know because a, a hep C actually has antiviral drugs that can be used to treat it. So your risk factors here are a patient that you know is infected with hepatitis C, that's, a, that's an obvious one, um, or a patient that has hepatitis C risk factors, and those are uh, any kind of bloodborne contact and possibility for bloodborne transmission, so that would be hepatitis um, f hepatitis C uh, carriers as long-term sex partners. This is not a common sexually transmitted infection, but if you have repeat sexual contact with an infected person, it can be transmitted that way. Um, but the biggies are, are needle use, so that would be tattoo needles and uh, IV drug use. For Parvovirus B19, um, the, the big one here that you would see is a recent epidemiological contact who's had fifth disease. We met this virus before in block one as being a, a causative agent of this kind of nuisance -y childhood illness, um, but it, it can be quite serious for caregivers should they, um, in some rare instance, come up with a viral cardiac infection from it. And the final one that you occasionally see is... Um, is adenovirus. Uh, we again met this guy as a as a causer of just junky common cold symptoms, but it can again uh, cause cardiac illnesses. So if you have a valve patient who comes in with shortness of breath and chest pain, and someone in their house has recently had a cold, you've got one, two, three, four possible four possible causative agents. And then you might want to, if you're being really thorough, check for these two guys as well. Um, uh, that would be Parvo and, and Hep C. So that being said, those are our heart infections. Second video in this series is going to be about hematological parasites, and we'll get back to it very soon, starting with one that winds up as a heart infection. Ten points if you figure out what it is. Just kidding, I don't have a way to assign points. But if I did, you would have them. Okay. Flame on. See you in a second.